So re-evaluating PGTA. So let me just confess before starting this presentation that I am a clinician. So what, and I think most of uh, us who are in this conference are clinicians as well. So I've been looking at things from the clinical perspective. So I'm not going to be looking at it from a biological or genetic perspective, but more from a clinical perspective, which is relevant to us day in and day out when we are seeing our patients. So how do we translate what evidence is there? What is the current thoughts? What are the controversies and how do we deal with this in our current setting in advising our patients and what is the right thing to do with our patients? So that is what is going to be covered in this lecture. And hopefully when we open up for discussions, you will give us interesting thoughts, comments, questions, which will be, which will stimulate more discussion. So a little bit of the outline, how we would like to approach it. Rationale, I'll start with basics, rationale for PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, what was called pre-implantation genetic screening in the olden days, uh, and then how the evolution took place from PGS, first generation PGS, PGS10 to PGS20, second generation PGS. Let us ask ourselves, who could benefit from PGTA? So these are relevant questions for all of us, as much as it is for me, it is for everyone as well. And what are the outcomes for assessing the effectiveness of PGTA? What clinical outcomes? What are we interested in? Or what is our patient interested in? And can PGTA improve these outcomes? And let us look at current evidence and conclusions. In looking at the current evidence, there is a lot out there with regards to PGTA, but in this presentation, I was just be focusing on randomized controlled trials to, um, to make a, a, a synthesis of the evidence because we know that randomized controlled trials are the topmost in the evidence pyramid. So a bit about the background. We all know that human conception is considerably inefficient. So we are the most inefficient reproducers when it comes to mammals. Other mammals are much more efficient in their reproduction compared to us. The fecundity rate, if we are very generous, is around 40% per menstrual cycle. And the chance of a recognized clinical pregnancy is around 30% per menstrual cycle. And this is very generous. It could be even lower than that. And extensive loss of uh, pregnancies occur in early conceptions at preclinical and clinical stage. We all know that. And embryo aneuploidy is the major reason for failed conceptions and pregnancy losses. Again, that is common knowledge. So embryo aneuploidy is the main contributor here for the low fecundability in humans and also the high loss of pregnancies, early conceptions at the preclinical and clinical stage. So aneuploidy is also a barrier to the efficiency of ART. We know that ART, yes, it is the topmost among the various fertility treatments, but we always have this barrier that we cannot enhance the um, outcomes or the success rates beyond a certain limit. And one of the barrier is aneuploidy. And PGS is based on the hypothesis that the selection of euploid oocytes, euploid embryos, lead to improved ART IVF outcomes. And it was first introduced in the early 1990s. And then from then, it has evolved from the first generation PGS to second generation PGS. And now we have newer concepts of non-invasive pre-implantation genetic testing. So first generation PGS. So this uh, slide depicts uh, quite nicely what first generation PGS is. And first generation PGS involves either a, um, um, a blastomere biopsy or polar border body biopsy, and then analysis of a fixed number of chromosomes, not all the chromosomes, a certain number of chromosomes using fish, and then whatever is determined as euploidy by this uh, fish analysis, that embryo is transferred, and the aneuploid embryo is not transferred. So that is uh, PGS, as, as is shown uh, nicely in this figure. And it was widely applied for 15 years. So it was, um, as we said, it was started in the early 1990s and widely applied for 15 years. Then what happened to the first generation PGS? There was this randomized controlled trial, which many of you would be familiar with. And that was from uh, the Netherlands, led by Sebastian Masterbrook, and which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a multi-center randomized controlled trial 
comparing three cycles of IVF with or without PGS in women who were deemed to be of older reproductive age, that is age between 35 to 41 years. So there were 206 women in the PGS arm, and this was first generation PGS, that is day three biopsy, that biopsy of the embryo on day three, and blastomere biopsy, and fish analysis of a um, uh, of few chromosomes, not all chromosomes. Versus the control arm, where the selection of the embryo was basically based on morphology, as we would do in routine practice. And what they found is that the ongoing pregnancy rate is significantly lower in the PGS arm, 25%, versus the non-PGS arm, which was 37%. And live birth rate was also significantly lower in the PGS arm at 24% versus 35% in the non-PGS arm. So PGS did not increase, but instead significantly decreased the ongoing pregnancy and live birth rate in women of advanced reproductive age. And that was the conclusion of this paper. And this was followed by uh, same, the same um, uh, lead author, Sebastian Mastenbrook, by a systematic review and meta-analysis that combined all randomized controlled trials of first generation PGS, um, as you can see here. And what they found is by uh, in the various uh, groups of patients, whether it was an indication for advanced maternal age, whether it was indication for good prognosis patients, whether it was an indication for repeated implantation failure, PGS did not improve the outcome of live birth. You can see that if it was advanced maternal age or if it was implantation failure, repeated implantation failure, first generation PGS resulted in a significantly lower live birth rate compared to no PGS. So uh, following this trial of the, the, that was published, the large multicenter RCT that was published in New England Journal of Medicine and this uh, meta-analysis, there were policy statements issued by the uh, ESHRE and ASRM that there was no evidence to support the clinical use of routine, routine clinical use of PGS. At that time, there was only first generation PGS, mostly done using blastomere biopsy and fish analysis of a certain fixed number of chromosomes, around eight. Uh, set of chromosomes. So why was PGS10 ineffective or detrimental? So yeah, before that, people were you know, quite excited about using PGS. And uh, when this trial came and the policy say statements uh, were issued, then the question came as why was PGS, first generation PGS ineffective? And the reasons could be, the speculated reasons are, cleavage stage biopsy is detrimental to the embryo because there are only few cells. So removing uh, whatever few cells, uh, one or, or two cells could be detrimental. There is incomplete chromosomal assessment with FISH because FISH is analyzing only a certain number of chromosomes. It's not analyzing the entire set of chromosomes. So there is incomplete chromosomal assessment. So there could be other things which are missed in other chromosomes, mosaic, um, abnormalities in other chromosomes that can be missed. And also there's higher level of mosaicism in day three embryos. So if you're removing only two cells and there is higher mosaicism in day three embryos, then pro probably you are, dis and if those two happen to be the abnormal ones, aneuploid um, cells, whereas the others are euploid, then you're discarding that embryo. So that could be the reason. And also it could be that if you were to take an embryo and tested it as being um, aneuploid, if you took two blastomeres, tested them to be aneuploid, but it could be a mosaic embryo. And a mosaic embryo as it grows is known to self-correct self -correct itself and therefore you're discarding embryos unnecessarily. So these were the reasons why, potential reasons why the first generation PGS was uh, uh, was uh, assumed to be ineffective or detrimental. So after a lull, then there was resurgence of PGS and that came with the second generation PGS, PGS20. And what is PGS20? Again, very, very nicely depicted in this figure. Here you have a blastocyst and um, uh, it involves biopsy of cells from the blastocyst, trophectoderm. Here we can get more cells from uh, what we get uh, from a blasto, um, uh, cleavage stage embryo biopsy, a blastomeres, one or two, whereas here we can get more cells, five, 10, or even more perfected on cells. And these cells are analyzed for all chromosomes. So there is comprehensive chromosome analysis. So the entire whole genome is amplified and you have various uh, platforms um, whereby this can be done. 
And again, the concept is to transfer a euploid embryo and not uh, transfer an aneuploid embryo. That's second generation PGS and we all know about it. So what is the evidence with second generation PGS? So the first randomized control trial was in 2012 and this was presented in, the, in ASRM as an oral presentation and it won the uh, ASRM prize in 2012 and I remember they were, it, it, it made headline news uh, in, uh, in papers in the UK at that time. So this was a randomized controlled trial. And here they're looking at second generation PGS whereby comprehensive chromosome screening with vitrification was done. Yeah, And they looked at women who were aged more than 35 years, randomized at oocyte retrieval to either flesh blastocyst transfer following morphological selection. So that would be the routine, what we do. So you would have um, women whose embryos were selected based on morphology versus the second one is a study arm, where, which is the PGS arm, whereby they had uh, trophectoderm biopsy, comprehensive chromosome screening. So all uh, chromosomes were analyzed uh, with SNP microarray. Then the embryos were frozen and then replaced in the frozen uh, embryo transfer later on. And the results showed a viable implantation rate was significantly higher in the PGS arm, 60.8% versus 40.9%. But note that the uh, outcome here is the implantation rate. So we don't have uh, information about the clinical pregnancy rate, ongoing pregnancy rate and the live birth rate. And for the implantation rate, it is the number of transferred embryos, which is the denominator. It's not uh, the number of women randomized, which would be ideal. And they also showed that the uh, miscarriage rate was significantly lower in the PGS arm, which was about 0%. It was all good, but it looks too good. And also what is important to bear in mind is that the number of patients are uh, uh, in each arm are small, around 30 patients. And also this paper, uh, this never made it into a full paper in the sense that to scrutinize it further. So it was an oral abstract that won the presentation in, with, that won the prize, SRM prize in 2012, as you can see, and this is what was presented. It looks all very good, but we have many other questions which we cannot um, answer from this abstract because it didn't make it to the full paper. So what else? What are the other? So this one showed that in infertile women more than 35 years of age, there was an increase in the implantation rate. What about other studies? This is another study again. Uh, so the first study is from the United States. This is again from uh, a group between uh, China and the United States. And it is selection of single, single blastocysts for fresh transfer via standard morphology assessment alone, that is a routine, and with array CGS for good prognosis patients. The previous study was for women aged more than 35 years. Here it is looking at good prognosis patients patients and this was a pilot study and what they found when uh, you see um, the results here again it's a pilot study so small numbers on each group 55 versus 48 and what you can see here looking at the clinical pregnancy and ongoing pregnancy i.e pregnancy at 20 weeks or more what they showed is that in the PGS arm this was much better significantly improved compared to the routine morphological selection arm. But again, all these studies, small numbers, they were not powered. And also, um, I, mean, I mean, before making any conclusions, we have to look at the robust, robustness of the study and whether it is applicable in our units. So this is another study. The previous one looking at older age women, this one looking at good prognosis patients. So then there have been further randomized controlled trials, and most of these are from EVRMA and uh, Richard Scott's team in the US. And they did um, the trials, the aims of the trials, uh, which they did was for different reasons. And this is one of the trials. And here, the aim of this trial, this randomized controlled trial, was to determine if PGS and single embryo transfer can achieve comparable ongoing pregnancy rate whilst reducing multiple gestation compared to double embryo transfer without PGS. So in the US, um, um, 
probably uh, Professor George will explain later. Most of the IVF is um, is not uh, not funded by the um, health uh, system or the there is no public funding for IVF, and therefore to increase uh, their pregnancy rates, there used to be much more wider use of multiple embryo transfers, and therefore a higher rate of multiple pregnancies, and therefore you know. Clinics want to increase the success rate, offer the women the best chances of pregnancy uh, with the first IVF cycle because they have to pay. Uh, there is no uh, public funding and the cycles are very expensive. So here he wanted to determine if PGS will allow them to reduce the multiple pregnancy rate and allow them to convince women to have a single embryo transfer over double embryo transfer without affecting the pregnancy rates. So in this study, women less than 43 years were included and the mean age was around 35 years. The randomization was done on day five on day or day six if there were two or more expanded blastocysts. And the, and the comprehensive uh, chromosome screening was PCR based and the ones in the PGSR either had fresh day six or a frozen embryo transfer. In their setting, they could have a fresh day six transfer because they had an in-house um, um, in-house laboratory which, where they could get the results immediately with regards to the genetic testing and I was told that they would do the day six transfer very early in the morning whereas in settings whereby we don't have the in-house um, assessment genetic assessment we would have to do a freeze all so they did have the option of doing day six or freeze all and these are the outcomes so in each of the slides, you will notice that I have highlighted some of the aspects on where the randomization is. And you will note that in every study, the randomization occurred at different stages. For the first study, it occurred at oocyte retrieval. In here, it's happening on day five, day six. In this study, it happened um, uh, at, the, uh, at the time of day three embryo. So it's the randomization is at different stages. So let us see what they found in this study by Foreman from um, the United States with regards to the multiple pregnancy and live birth rate. On the top, you can see the clinical pregnancy and ongoing pregnancy rate. And the blue is single euploid blastocyst transfer and the yellow is two untested blastocyst transfers. So single euploid blastocyst transfer, single embryo transfer with uh, PGS is the blue. And the second one is yellow, no PGS, but double embryo transfer, double blastocyst transfer. And what you can see is that the clinical pregnancy and the ongoing pregnancy are comparable in the two groups. If you go down to the uh, slide uh, figure below, when you look at twins and triplets, you will see that the ones which had uh, PGS and single embryo transfer had virtually no multiple pregnancy, no twins or triplets, whereas the ones which had double embryo transfer had a wide, very high incidence of um, multiple pregnancy, twins and triplets. So what they demonstrated from here is that in their setting in the United States, they said that use of a PGS and single embryo transfer can uh, lower the multiple pregnancy rate with whilst maintaining the clinical pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy and live birth rate. So it does not cause any detriment, but it will allow them to do a single embryo transfer over a double embryo transfer and reduce the multiple pregnancy rates significantly. So that's what this trial showed. So again, from the same group, uh, this is another randomized controlled trial. And the aim of this randomized controlled trial was to determine if PGS improves IVF implantation and delivery rates. And women in this study were aged less than 43 years with a mean age of 32 years. And the randomization was on day five as they did in their previous study. If two or more blastocysts were available and they had uh, they did comprehensive chromosome screening using qPCR and fresh day five transfer in the control arm, day six fresh transfer in the study arm. So in the study arm and control arm, both of the, uh, all of them had fresh transfer uh, because they had in-house um, uh, genetic um, testing. They could do a day six fresh transfer in their um, in their clinics and settings. So this was to determine if the embryo implantation is improved by PGS. That means if you're selecting one embryo, uh, does that have a better implantation rate with the use of PGS compared to an embryo which is selected by morphology alone? So let us see what they found. And what they found is that generally, if you look at the first 
figure, you will find that the sustained implantation rate. That means if you put back one embryo, what is the chance of that embryo resulting in a pregnancy? They found that it was generally good in both. So this was the, the blue is the comprehensive chromosome screening, that is the PGS, and the red is the control. Uh, and both of them had good sustained implantation rate. It was much higher in the PGS arm. So when they came, looked further into the clinical outcomes, such as the clinical pregnancy and the delivery rate, you will see that the, again, the outcomes were good in both hands. So probably the units are good. And what, they, what you can see is that the, uh, it is much higher per embryo transferred. This is for each embryo transferred, the delivery rate was much higher with the um, PGS arm, the blue, compared to the red. And that was the purpose of their study. So with each study, which I showed so far, they had different um, aims or different objectives uh, that they wanted to demonstrate. And so again, uh, this is a study. This is a study from Europe and um, uh, from Spain. And um, this is looking, this is a slightly different uh, variation of PGS, whereby um, they wanted to look at women in PGS in women of older age group, but here they did a combination of uh, first generation and second generation PGS, i.e. they did a biopsy on day three, that is at the blastomere biopsy uh, at the cleavage stage, and then they did a comprehensive chromosome uh, screening using array CGS. So they analyzed all chromosomes in the uh, blastomeres, and then they took uh, the embryos up to the blastocyst stage and then transferred the embryos uh, in the PGS arm based on their euploidy status. So here you can see the results. So the PGS arm and no PGS arm. And uh, we said here that the PGS, the biopsy was done on day three and then they had tested all chromosomes. So comprehensive chromosome screening. And what they found, they looked at cumulative delivery rate. That means including deliveries from fresh and frozen embryos from one cycle. They found that there was no significant difference in the cumulative delivery rate with the PGS or no PGS arm. And that makes sense because here with PGS, we are not creating any extra embryos. We have the same number of embryos, whether we do PGS or no PGS. We're only trying to use PGS to improve the selection over just morphology alone because morphology you know, might not be the um, uh, to uh, might not be very uh, the best way of selection. So to add an added layer, you're, you're introducing PGS. So it's expected that the cumulative live birth rate will be the same because it's the same number of embryos. What they demonstrated in the study is that the delivery rate after the first embryo transfer, the first embryo transfer. So in the PGS arm it was 52.9% and in the no PGS arm it was 24.2%. So they found that there was significant improvement per, um, uh, in the first embryo transfer if the embryo selection was based on PGS. And they also found that there was a shorter time to pregnancy with the PGS and transfer of euploid embryo compared to no PGS arm. So that was their finding. Okay, so I, told, I just asked you, said that I was, um, I, I highlighted the day of randomization in each of the studies that we looked at, the randomized controlled trials. What you will see is that the randomization occurred at different stages. So for some of them, it occurred after oocyte retrieval. For some of them, for some of the studies, it was on day five when two or more blastocysts were available. So, and for some of them, you know, um, it occurred in between. If there were more than certain number of embryos on day three, then they were randomized. So this brings to this uh, debate. This is a, a very nice um, opinion or debate that was published in Human Reproduction, which says that when we're looking at RCTs, it is we find that there is no common denominator. There's no common denominator because if, you, as I showed you in this one, um, the women are being randomized at different stages. So it is not a woman who's starting the treatment, but it could be at any stage. So likewise, there is no common denominator in the RCTs which we which uh, which we saw, and therefore this very much pertains to uh, the PGS um, scenario. And what they said is many combinations of numerator and denominator are in use and often employed in a manner that compromise the validity of the study. So 
when we look at studies, we have to look and see what the numerator is, what the denominator is, and do they make sense? Is it transparent? Is it real? Can we reflect it into our own practice? So it's good it practice to dig into the studies a bit more than just by going with the author's conclusion. Sometimes the authors could be biased. They might want to show what they believe in. So it's always good to look into it further. So following on from the randomized controlled trials, um, uh, which we looked at so far, excluding the abstract uh, uh, that was by Schoolcraft in 2012, ASRM, which was not published in full text. All the full text papers were put into a systematic review and meta-analysis and published in fertility sterility. And they found, and the main outcome is implantation rate. And they found is that PGS significantly improves PGS, second generation PGS significantly improves the implantation rate. So then let's go to the more recent randomized control trial. And this has been, came out uh, late last year. Actually, uh, the, uh, the STAR trial, the study was finished quite some time back and uh, the abstract came and everybody was waiting for this uh, full paper to come out, which came out um, last year in fertility sterility. And this is a randomized controlled trial comparing pregnancy rates following PGS versus standard morphology for elective single embryo transfer. Whereas all the previous studies are smaller studies, usually based uh, you know, in single centers or, say, or, or, a group or, or similar settings, this was a much wider or one of the largest randomized controlled trial involving 650 women from four countries, 34 sites, and nine genetic laboratories. And the inclusion criteria was wide. It was uh, women aged 25 to 40 years, it, if, and they should have had l l two or less uh, previous failed IVF cycles, one or, a le one or less pre previous miscarriage, and not a carrier of a single gene disorder or chromosome abnormality. So that was an inclusion criteria. So the inclusion criteria was very broad in the sense that 25 to 48 years women, and if you look at the um, um, uh, look at it, is generally good prognosis patients. And what they found, if you look at here, the first one looks at the age group of 25 to 34 years. They found that there was no significant difference in the ongoing pregnancy rate. Ongoing pregnancy rate is defined as pregnancy at 20 weeks uh, and further. Then if you look at uh, women at 35 to 40 years of age, they found that there was a significantly higher uh, chance of ongoing pregnancy rate in the PGS group, that is the second um, bars. And, but if you looked at all ages, that is um, 25 to 40 years age group, which this trial was uh, set up to address, they found that there was no significant difference in the uh, ongoing pregnancy rate. So when they did a post hoc analysis, uh, that is post hoc analysis into the different age, sub, age subgroups, they found that they could in the, in the 35 to 40 year age group, there could be a benefit. But again, you have to understand that this was a post hoc analysis. And what they found is with regards to miscarriage, there was no significant difference with PGS or no PGS across all age groups. Okay, so we've looked at PGS in the context of IVF and we will look at all the randomized controlled trials that have been published so far. So next I'm going to look at another question, which is PGS for women with recurrent miscarriage. So with recurrent unexplained recurrent miscarriage that means no other no underlying abnormality genetic abnormality is found is pgs of any value so recurrent miscarriage where it is unexplained so this is a study this was published in human reproduction and this brought about a lot of discussion as well interesting discussion as well this is a retrospective cohort analysis and this is based from the united states and in this study what they looked at is they looked at clinical outcomes and the groups were women who had recurrent miscarriage. There was no abnormality found, which we which we encounter quite often. And there were they I, and these women had either IVF treatment with PGS or they were left to con, uh, to conceive naturally because these women were not infertile. They were fer, uh, fertile women. And what you can see is that. 
by doing IV, uh, IVF and PGS in women with unexplained recurrent miscarriage does not improve the outcomes. So in no way improves the outcomes. It is as good as them conceiving naturally. It does not improve the outcomes in terms of clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate, or um, any other outcomes. Even time to pregnancy also, it does not uh, affect. So in this scenario, PGS does not have any value. So let me move on briefly to the issue of mosaicism because mosaicism is an issue which is often heard of in the context of PGS. And what is mosaicism? Because embryos are not just um, uh, scored as being euploid or aneuploid. There is in between, which is mosaicism. And what is mosaicism? Mosaicism is not all embryonic cells share identical chromosome complements despite originating from the same zygote. And this is due to mitotic errors resulting in chromosomally distinct cell populations, which are diploid and aneuploid cell lines. So, so you have mitotic errors resulting in mosaicism with normal euploid and um, uh, which are diploid and the aneuploid cell lines. Lower levels of aneuploidy are seen with increasing gestational age. So you have, if you have an embryo that is a, a mosaic and aneuploid at, uh, blast, uh, at the cleavage stage, as it, it progresses to the blastocyst stage, you will see less of mosaicism because uh, likely mechanism is that any, there is aneuploidy self-correction or mechanism, mechanism by which aneuploid cells are outcompeted by the euploid cells. So the euploid cells are uh, outnumber the aneuploid cells. And hence, as the gestation progresses from cleavage stage to blastocyst stage to uh, an early fetus to later on, the mosaicism decreases. Um, and that is a commonly known thing. But then in the beginning, when they were doing PGS with first generation or uh, second generation, they would be transferring only euploid embryos. And what they found is that very, uh, very um, about five years ago, and this was the very first paper, and there have been several uh, papers published after that showing that they are aneuploid, aneuploid embryos can also result in pregnancies. They can also result in live births and they can result in live births with normal karyotype. And this was the first study that was published in the NEJM, whereby they had women who had anu mosaic aneuploid embryos. And because they did not have completely euploid embryos, these women were consented and had the embryos uh, transferred 18 of them and out of the 18 of them eight of them had clinical pregnancies and six of them had singleton live births and all had all babies had normal karyotype despite being a mosaic embryo being put back and this um, uh, figure will give you a very comprehensive um, um, comprehensive display of what types of mosaicism they can be. So how they can be varying from trophectoderm to um, inner cell mass, inner cell mass within itself, trophectoderm within itself. So it's uh, good to look at this figure to give an idea of how the various mosaic um, aneuploidies, aneuploid embryos, mosaic embryos can be. Mosaic euploid, whether you call them mosaic euploid or whether mosaic aneuploid, how the blastocyst mosaicism can uh, occur. So there was a, 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 an opinion paper which was put together in human reproduction and this was by uh, experts, uh, clinical, biological and embryological uh, experts in uh, PGS and look opining about the current practices and what will be the future of PGS. And what they said is that Current thoughts were that now we are clear on the definition of second generation PGS. So it involves blastocyst stage biopsy, it involves analysis of all chromosomes, comprehensive chromosome screening and vitrification. And it was agreed that mosaicism is less of an issue at blastocyst stage compared to what was in the first generation PGS that was at the cleavage stage embryo. So it is less of a problem now. But we still don't know if the mosaicism, to what level the mosaic, mosaicism is an issue at the blastocyst stage. So we still are not clear with regards to what level of mosaicism is an issue at the blastocyst stage. And there is research ongoing with regards to that. So let us ask a few questions. Why should we do PGS? Who would benefit from PGS? So let us ask these questions. Some of them are not uh, completely answered or most of them are not answered. Should we be doing it for recurrent implantation failure? Should we be doing for repeated miscarriages where there is no underlying abnormality? 
Should we be doing it for advanced maternal age? Should we be doing for everybody, um, young and good prognosis patients, everybody undergoing IVF? Should we be doing it for egg donor cycles? There are some units that do it for egg donor cycles because they think that they want to give the best embryo to the uh, recipient. Or should we say that there is no indication for second generation PGS? These are some of the questions. And, but then the answer to these questions depends upon what we define as success, what we would as clinicians think of success or what our patients would think is success for them. Is it having a baby? Doesn't matter when they have the baby, whether they have it now or whether they have it in a year's time or two years, is it just a live birth? Is it to reduce time to pregnancy? They do not want to come back for another cycle or an umbra, another embryo transfer, another embryo transfer, another embryo transfer. They want, do they want to come have a pregnancy at the short of possible time? Does it reduce miscarriages? Does it reduce multiple births? You know, do you want to give them a single embryo transfer, no double embryo transfer with the best chance of pregnancy, not bringing the pregnancy down compared to a multiple transfer? And reduce live birth, do you want to give them um, pregnancies which have no aneuploid at all, you know, because you're doing a comprehensive chromosome screening, you're screening uh, embryos for downs and um, uh, other such aneuploidies. And what about cumulative live birth rate? We saw that it does not improve cumulative live birth rate because we're not creating extra embryos. And again, the how is which amplification method. You saw in the various studies, they use different amplification methods and the different methods for uh, testing all the chromosomes. But what we are uh, moving now and uh, with regards to used um, uh, routinely in clinical practice and also research settings is next generation sequencing. So next generation sequencing is the one that is being currently highlighted as the best and being used. And other comments. So do we just uh, replace embryos based on euploidy and euploidy? But I think that's not, uh, that's not just the way to do it. We, yes, if there is a euploid embryo, we replace it. But again, with the mosaic embryos, we don't discard them. Perhaps we can rank the embryos based on the level of euploidy and uh, mosaicism, and then um, select the embryos in that order. The first, if you have a completely euploid embryo, put it back first, but don't discard the other embryos, which are mosaic. Yeah, they still um, um, are available and then if not, if pregnant or not pregnant and they want another, if they're not pregnant or if they're pregnant and want another child, use the left mosaic embryos, don't, we don't discard them. And also the detection levels depend on the technologies and the laboratories. Different laboratories have different cutoffs on where they set their cutoff for a, 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 a euploid or aneuploid embryo. They have different cutoffs. I'm trying to set up a trial and I've gone, up, uh, gone about laboratories to see what their thresholds are and different laboratories for the same technique have different thresholds. So that is something to bear in mind as well. And we still don't know the true significance of aneuploidy because we saw in the studies that aneuploid mosaic embryos can result in live births, although their chance, you know, although probably the implantation rate is lower. So in conclusion, if we were to have a patient in front of us and if the patient was going to ask us, would we offer them PGS or no PGS, I think we should say what we know or what is there in, in terms of evidence. Um, that is to make an informed and shared decision making between clinicians and patients, understand the patient expectations, why do they want it, L explain to them what the cost implications are, but why do they want it, what are the expectations, do they want uh, um, you know, to avoid multiple pregnancy, do, do they want a shorter time to live birth, do they, you know, what their expectations are and explain to them what we don't know as well, what is gray area for us, explain current evidence as it is, what equipoise we are, what uncertainties we have, and also uh, the cost implications are very important because it comes, everything comes with a cost. And for that, we need robust randomized controlled trials for the various suggested indications and various outcomes of interest. What is the outcome of interest? Is it live birth per embryo transfer? Is it time to pregnancy? Is it miscarriage reduction? Is it reduction of multiple pregnancies? And also we need to justify where we randomize the women. So all in, if, if you look at this in a very open, um, open-minded way, then we can come to a fair disc, an honest discussion with our patients and make decisions. And um, we need studies to look at cost effectiveness for live birth as well. Thank you very much for your attention.